So uh, first uh, we go to a small clip which should work. Yes, it is working. International. In 1957, an agency was created with a vision to harness the power of the atom for the benefit of humankind. It works with partners across the globe to help countries use nuclear science and technology to meet development challenges. Boosting food supplies, improving health, protecting the environment, and contributing to global peace. This agency provides the technology, expertise, and training to make all this possible. Through nuclear science, it helps countries to develop high-yielding crops that can thrive in extreme conditions, breed healthier livestock, and protect fruit and animals from harmful pests. The work of this agency supports the conservation of our oceans and coastlines, protecting the marine resources that ensure the livelihoods of millions of people. It promotes the use of nuclear technology to fight cancer and improve human health. The organization assists countries with their energy planning. If they choose nuclear power, it offers expertise to ensure facilities are run safely and securely. It provides standards and assistance to ensure the safe use of radioactive materials guidance on the management of the waste generated by the use of nuclear technologies and helps nations to prepare for and respond to incidents and emergencies. It's an agency that prevents the spread of nuclear weapons by helping to make sure that nuclear materials remain in peaceful uses. It's the global platform for cooperation in nuclear security advising countries how to guard against nuclear terrorism and prevent the theft and smuggling of radioactive materials. Providing technology and expertise. Promoting safety and security. Assisting sustainable development. This is Atoms for Peace and Development. This is the IAEA. Okay, thank you. So uh, this uh, is the main theme which I would like to run through this presentation and return to it many times, uh, which is that this agency, the IAEA, which I'd like uh, to present to you, is working in, in, many, in essentially two domains. Uh, peace, international peace and security, and uh, development, science and development. This is not entirely obvious because when you uh, reflect upon what is written in, in the global media about the agency, we are mostly the nuclear watchdog. And, and uh, the other part is too silent uh, to our taste, frankly speaking. So that's why I'd like to return to this many times to demonstrate that it's not just the inspections in Iran, which is uh, uh, what the agency is, is doing. Now, we are an autonomous international organization, and this is another misconception which this slide is supposed to address. Quite often people think that we are part of the United Nations, that we are a UN agency, um, and that maybe we were created in 1945 uh, along with the UN, or maybe we were created by the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty in 1970 by the NPT. Well, neither of this is true. We have our own uh, timeline of, of development, which uh, has more to do 
with the end of the Cold War and the fact that countries decided to work uh, on, on the peaceful uses of atomic energy in the 50s. Uh, so our, um, our timeline is different than the usual timeline and also our uh, statute is not being part of the UN. Um, we are part of the broadly speaking UN system. We have 170 member states, so uh, 173, which means we are almost universal. Uh, we have almost 3000 staff, which um, as you see, is quite big for a, for a specialized uh, international organization in this domain, especially if you compare us with, say, the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons in The Hague, which has well, hundreds of staff. We have thousands of, of staff. We are headquartered in Vienna, in the Vienna International Center, the VIC, which is also known to the Austrians as the UNOCITY. We are the only international organization which actually has rather sizable laboratories, which are in three places. Some of them are in our building, in our main building, but we have a separate site in Seibersdorf in Austria, outside of Vienna, and we have maritime laboratories in Monaco. We have two regional safeguards offices in Toronto and Tokyo from which our inspectors, some of our inspectors work. This is to avoid uh, too long travel across the distance uh, and, and uh, uh, the, 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 you know, the delays and so on and uh, the jet lag. Uh, so uh, the, the facilities, nuclear facilities in Canada and some of those in the Western Hemisphere are, um, are inspected by uh, our inspectors who live and work in Toronto. And the same applies to uh, facilities in Japan and some other places. And we have two small liaison offices in New York and Geneva. In terms of structure, we have uh, six big departments. Uh, the, the biggest of them is, is the safeguards uh, department with hundreds of, of inspectors and the staff supporting them. The smallest, I believe, is, is nuclear energy. Uh, and we have some uh, offices which support all departments, like, uh, for example, the, the Office of Legal Affairs or Public Communication, which has actually prepared this presentation. It's prepared by um, OPIC, the Office for Public Information and, and Communication. I work in Director General's uh, office. We have uh, two major policy-making organs. Um, one of them is a general conference, uh, which is all member states and obviously observers are also invited. It meets once a year, usually in the second half of September. But we have a, a very powerful um, board of governors. So this is uh, for us uh, the uh, policy-making organ on most uh, highly charged political issues like, for example, the discussions uh, on, on Iran. It means regularly five times per year, but there is also a provision for extraordinary board meetings and, and these, they do happen. I mean, when I was the uh, ambassador of Poland here in 2000, between 2004 and 2008, uh, I, I sat on the Board of Governors, I was a Vice Chair of the Board, and actually we did have extraordinary Board meetings uh, back then to discuss the non-compliance of, of, of uh, Iran. Uh, the main areas of, of work are science and technology, safety and security, safeguards and verification. The National Atomic Energy Agency runs a range of unique laboratories that drive sustainable development. These 12 high-tech facilities in Austria and Monaco are using cutting-edge science to address some of the biggest challenges faced by humanity. Nuclear scientists know that studying our world at the atomic level can give us the insights we need to unlock the planet's secrets. 
because you can't solve a problem that you don't understand. The nuclear application labs are focused on applied research into human health, food security, and environmental protection. They are distinct from the IAEA facilities that are used in the search for traces of undeclared nuclear activities. From preparing for the next pandemic, to tracking the sustainability of our water supplies, to tracing contaminants in global food chains, research at the atomic level can give us precise information about our complex natural world. For example, researching marine health, like monitoring the current ocean acidification crisis or assessing the movement of plastics through fish and onto our plates. Nuclear scientists are also at the forefront of research into climate smart agriculture techniques, such as breeding drought resistant and high yield plants or examining soil to determine the optimal amount of water or fertilizer. Some of these labs are run jointly with the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. They undertake vital research and testing to enhance agricultural production and food security and to help combat major zoonotic diseases such as COVID-19 and Zika. They run the agency's sterile insect program, which uses radiation as a form of insect birth control naturally suppressing the population of major invasive pests like fruit flies without the use of pesticides. Radiation therapy is an essential tool in modern healthcare and the IAEA dosimetry lab helps set international standards for safe and effective radiotherapy. The IAEA's nuclear application laboratories provide all these technical and environmental services and many more at the request of member states. The discoveries that are made and techniques that are developed in these laboratories are shared with the world, helping to drive sustainable development. Okay, so uh, nuclear science and technology, uh, the, the film, uh, this film has listed some of the usages to which uh, nuclear or nuclear derived technologies can be put to. And I admit some of this is counterintuitive. Uh, it doesn't immediately comes uh, to mind, uh, but we have a number of labs which are developing uh, these applications. Uh, isotope hydrology, I mean, in the current world where there is a, a shortage of, of water, actually the analysis which are done thanks to uh, the application uh, which, which is developed in the agency has been very useful in, in Africa, for example. Uh, plant breeding, also developing uh, new types of crops uh, and also uh, the um, ra uh, radio ecology uh, analysis. I, there are some uh, techniques which I will point out to you. The sterile insect technique, essentially sterilizing uh, insects so that uh, they mate uh, uh, unsuccessfully and, and this lowers the population uh, of, of uh, insects have been uh, very effective. This is actually one of the best products, if I may say so, of the agency and, and much in demand. It's actually quite a, a, a smelly job. Uh, I admit that, you know, going to these labs in, in Zybersdorf when I went there for the first time and I saw how, in what conditions it's being done and it's, it's, it's not a a very sort of pleasant uh, type of, of job, but actually we are preparing currently, for example, DG's visit to one of countries in uh, in South America, where he is going to release the next batch of, of these uh, insects. Obviously, uh, the um, uh, cancer control, this is uh, more well known. 
we are cooperating very closely with WHO in this respect. Uh, we have uh, uh, missions, joint missions to assess uh, the needs of member states when it comes to radiation uh, therapy. Uh, and among the least known applications, for example, is uh, using gamma radiation uh, to um, eradicate uh, parasites in old historical objects, but also in uh, uh, checking uh, how old these objects are. And this has been used on uh, old uh, altars or even on uh, Egyptian mummies. So there is such a, a strange application of uh, nuclear uh, techniques. We obviously, as you can imagine, during the pandemic, we had to go much more to uh, different online applications, especially when it comes to uh, training and, and education. Uh, and this here is something which, which we are particularly proud of when it comes to health. So early in the pandemic, we have discovered that um, equipment which, which we use called RT-PCR, polymain chain reaction, uh, real time, uh, can be used to test for, uh, for COVID. And a number of countries in the world uh, had very little or none of, of, of this equipment. So we started sharing uh, what we have in our, what we had in our storage and then ordering it also outside and training uh, laboratories around the world. Uh, the numbers, um, it, it became an extra budgetary effort. Uh, the numbers, everything you see on the slides on this is probably overtaken by events because we keep on supplying these uh, RT-PCRs. Uh, it is a kind of lab in a box because some of those units are really like a suitcase uh, which can be used for, for testing. So, as you can see, around 10% of global electricity is, is provided by nuclear uh, power with uh, some 445 uh, reactors operating in 32 countries. I mean, it's more obviously more reactors than power plants because many power plants are more than one uh, reactor, more than one unit. And um, more is being built. The question which is now being discussed, and I think it's, it's, it's actually being debated, is to what extent the mm, nuclear power can be a part of the solution uh, for uh, the, the current Green Deal. And obviously, the scientific evidence is very clear here that it is low carbon electricity. So if the objective is decarbonization, and less um, emissions, uh, CO2 emissions, then uh, nuclear power uh, can provide this. And you have seen in the picture that actually the combination with uh, renewables is a good combination because uh, the nuclear can provide a base load power for constant uh, uh, provision to the electrical grid, while the renewables such as wind and solar actually fluctuate a lot. 
So given the limits in the current storage technologies that you cannot store um, from the peak time, there are limits in storing uh, energy. Uh, the combination of nuclear power with renewables is actually one of, the, uh, of, of, of those things we are working on. Uh, we have developed in the nuclear energy a so-called milestones approach, which basically means that we can take member states, uh, we can guide member states in their process of developing uh, nuclear um, uh, energy application uh, or nuclear energy generation. Currently, let's say Egypt or Turkey is going through this uh, process as having the first uh, powers uh, being built. Uh, I will move the slides forward a bit. So um, we not only assist countries in building nuclear uh, facilities, uh, but we also take care of safety and security. Obviously, primarily these are national responsibilities, but we can provide a lot of assistance. And obviously the difference between safety and security is something you are uh, familiar with. It's just for your reminder here. Essentially safety is to guard against accidents like Fukushima or Chernobyl. And security is to guard against misuse of nuclear material, uh, say by criminals or, or terrorists. Uh, legal instruments, uh, we obviously promote. Um, and then we move to the last most important part, which is the safeguards. And this is the nuclear watchdog function. Let's watch this one. Okay, so this is actually the last uh, point I wanted to uh, to make. Uh, this is about uh, safeguards and, and verification. For those of you who deal with NPT, the implementation of this treaty, the previous uh, points I was making, the previous slides were about the third pillar, the peaceful uses pillar. And this is all about uh, the second pillar, the, the safeguards, non-proliferation uh, pillar. Uh, we have a number of instruments, uh, comprehensive safeguards agreements, uh, additional protocol, small uh, quantities protocol. Those are the legal instruments. Uh, three uh, regional cases which are worth studying is IAEA inspections in Iraq. This is for what uh, the IAA received the Nobel Peace Prize actually in 2005. Uh, I mean, against this backdrop, uh, to be exact. Um, the case of DPRK, where we are currently, as you know, stuck because we have no inspectors uh, on site there in country, but we follow uh, the developments based on satellite imagery and other open sources. And we, uh, we are 
getting ready to go back in case there is a political agreement. So we actually do have a DPRK team in our safeguards department. And obviously the case with Iran, which you all follow uh, through the media and which is, uh, well, ongoing. I think it will come up in, in q and I am, I am confident. Technical cooperation is how we uh, provide the assistance to member states. Um, those of us, those of you who are uh, interested in, in gender issues uh, probably have heard about the new fellowship program, which was inaugurated uh, only last year by Director General Grossi. This is providing uh, very generous financial support to uh, women students of nuclear uh, science and, and technology. It's named after uh, Marie Skodowska Curie. Uh, involvement in plastics, involvement in uh, zoonotic diseases, uh, Nobel Peace Prize, uh, our social media, and actually I should go to the Q&A. I now invite the participants, if there is an opportunity for you to directly engage a very senior officer of the IEA. So um, please go ahead, uh, raise your hand if you have any questions. The first one I saw is Ricardo and then Elena. Thank you for presentation, Ambassador. I have uh, two questions. Uh, the first one is uh, related to uh, because you were you were showing this uh, interest in uh, 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 efforts that you take regarding uh, keeping emissions and you know keeping um, uh, a green a green procedure let's say or a green rationale regarding uh, nuclear energy. So I was wondering if there's any like particular measures or or procedures that would apply to the Fukushima power plant incident. And you know, because of all this enriched water has been leaked to the ocean, uh, if there are any like additional measures applied to this, and and probably the second one is is what are the the actions or the framework that you actually uh, use or coordinate with the Security Council uh, regarding the sanctions on Iran and DPRK on the nuclear programs. Thank you very much. Uh, usted habla polaco, habla muy bien. De qué país viene? Muchas gracias, embajador de Bolivia. Bolivia. Well, um, okay, maybe uh, I see there are many hands. Uh, Jean, I am in your, I am in your hands. Uh, shall we collect uh, topics uh, a bit and then I, I combine them? So here, what I, um, what I took uh, from this is, um, is Fukushima. Mm -hmm. Yes, and and sanctions is it was was that correct? Uh, the, the, did I sum up well? Let's, uh, let's also take Elena's question. Elena, you want to go ahead, please? Thank you. Uh, yeah, maybe I, if you could introduce yourself br briefly, okay? Yes. Uh, hi, Ambassador. My name is Elena Curcio. I'm a member of the Mexican uh, Foreign Service. Just a brief question. I mean, from your comp from your presentation, and very comprehensive, we understand that there's two main branches, one that speaks to peace and security, and the other one that speaks of science and development, and that you do um, an extensive amount of work in protecting the environment and climate change. Do you, would you say that it would be right? Would it be a, a correct uh, statement in saying that the IAEA sees protecting the environment and climate change more on the science and development side or on the peace and security, or is it more of a comprehensive issue? I mean, I mean to say uh, whether um, the work that you do uh, for, for climate change can be seen or is seen as a hard security issue. Thank mm -hmm. you. Okay. Yes, please. Next question. We, we don't have more questions, Jean. I am in your hands. Uh, I, I don't see any at this stage. So why don't we go ahead with those two? OK, great. So um, on Fukushima, I think two things are, are worth uh, saying. Uh, first of all, uh, the world and we 
uh, as the agency have learned a lot from the two major nuclear uh, accidents, uh, Chernobyl in 1986 and then Fukushima. We have uh, we have learned to uh, you know the, the lessons are there there are many lessons from this. The immediate lesson for the agency was actually to uh, have a very sophisticated and and uh, well developed incident and emergency center, which is one of the parts of the agency of which we we should be very proud. I mean it is a set of, uh, of offices where we have information about all nuclear facilities in the world. And we have actually computer programs to simulate different situations that ha can happen there. And this is a, a, an, a center which is uh, exercising all the time. I mean, it's not fully meant all the time, uh, we have real-time information from uh, on uh, on uh, radiation levels in different, uh, which are fed by member states, and we have people exercising regularly for uh, for um, and this took place even during COVID that are people on call and so on. So we feel that we are prepared for uh, for uh, another accident should it happen but actually the way the work on prevention on building the safety culture in member states is ongoing so we actually we uh, will have a conference on on fukushima uh, later this year it's been postponed like like many things and the conference will be on lessons learned from Fukushima, how much things have changed on what we have learned. The, the issue of the release of the, the treated water is a very hot issue these days because Japan has made the announcement. We are uh, on top of this, meaning that we have worked closely with Japan, assessed the technical um, implications of this. The release is due to start well, a year, at least a year, if not more from now. And um, and we will be providing advice to Japan. We have started ahead of the release. We will be there during release and we will be also providing uh, advice after the release and monitoring, including with the participation of uh, experts from the region. It is an IAEA run effort, but also experts from the region, from neighboring countries will be involved in assessing this. So, um, I mean, this is a topic obviously to, to watch. The, the question about sanctions, if I understood correctly, it was whether we use uh, sanctions as, as the agency, and this is not the case. I mean, the sanctions are either uh, international, I mean, they are relevant for our work in the sense that they reinforce cer certain uh, wishes of the international community, certain policies uh, and, and uh, but, but these sanctions are not sanctions which are uh, implemented by the IAEA the sanctions are either um, uh, from UN Security Council, as uh, is the case, say, well, I mean, in most cases, actually, there is a combination of sanctions, which are UN Security Council, regional organizations like the European Union has their own sets of sanctions. And then also there are national sanctions uh, against some countries. So um, it there is an interplay with with what we do, but these are not agency sanctions. Uh, science uh, versus peace, so climate change as, as, as hard security. Well, this goes a little bit beyond our remit of what the agency is doing, but it is true that um, the climate increasingly in international relations, uh, climate change is seen as a cause of conflict. Say lack of water becomes a ca cause of conflict or, or uh, droughts or floods which generate uh, waves of, uh, of, of refugees. 
So uh, the implications are far reaching, but they are not exactly what we are working on. I mean, we are working on addressing the root causes in a scientific way. Uh, and yes, indirectly, one could say we are also in this domain working on, on peace and security, because if a country doesn't have enough food or enough water, it very often leads to conflict. But uh, strictly speaking, we see this as two uh, different uh, areas of, of work. Atoms for peace, which is nuclear non-proliferation, and, and uh, for development, which is, for example, nuclear science in breeding uh, new, uh, new uh, types of, of, of uh, crops. Uh, I don't know whether I addressed the questions correctly, so you know, happy if you if you want to come back, please feel free, uh, and and also other other questions. Thank you. Jack. We have another question from uh, Blanca. You want to introduce yourself and ask your question, please? Sure. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. My name is uh, Blanca Villalon. I am a, a diplomat of the Mexican Foreign Service. I'm posted right now uh, at the Mexican mission to the OECD in Paris. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. It was really comprehensive and, and many things came up that uh, of course I was really not very much aware of. Um, one of the things right now that you were mentioning regarding the, the water release, I was wondering if there is any regulation in place regarding the treatment of this water previous to its release. Like, is there anything that you're guiding Japan to like uh, treat this water before it's released? Thank you so much. And, and uh, anyone else, or should I address uh, uh, Jean? Just what do you go, think? Let's go ahead. That's it. I don't see any questions. That yes. Want. Okay. So yes, I mean there are standards, there are regulations, and you know I am not an engineer myself to address you to this. The the thing which is not much in the media is that it is not such a unique situation. I mean, it is. it gets a lot of attention, obviously, these days. Uh, but actually, there are other facilities in the world which have in the past released or maybe are even now releasing uh, similarly treated water with thorium, which includes uh, thorium, and are releasing those to the oceans. Um, the, these, um, so, so this is not such, I mean, it's unique in terms of the amounts, but it is not uh, unique when it comes to the fact itself. Uh, so yes, there are standards, uh, yes, we are on top of it, and, and no, it is not like a unique uh, situation which has never happened in, in, in the past. Uh, this will, however, drag on. Uh, it, will, it will take uh, a lot of time. It will go into decades, probably, the, the release of, of this amount of water. And also because of regional sensitivities, you and as diplomats understand the history of relationship and so on. This, uh, this case gets more attention than uh, some of the other uh, releases of, of treated water which uh, either have taken place or are taking place now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any other yeah, well, well, maybe, maybe one more thing which, which uh, you might, uh, once uh, you are posted to OECD, um, we actually work quite closely with with the DAC uh, committee, the, um, and and for the audibility of of the uh, uh, extra budgetary assistance or you know in general assistance provided to the to the agency because the funding which member states provide to IAEA and this is another thing which very few people know about is actually duckable so or audible for for those of you who not like blanca are not aware so it actually uh, is counted by the oecd as overseas development assistance uh, when it comes to dealing with diseases and 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 so on thank you 
Well, thank you very much. I don't see any further questions and I also don't want to impose upon Ambassador Baleka's time too much. I know it's already late in Vienna, although I see from the uh, light at, outside the office that it's still nice and summer, summer weather in Vienna. So, um, Jessica, I'd like to, on behalf of everyone, thank you very much for your uh, very interesting presentation. Um, and thank you also for making the time available to answer uh, some questions. Uh, we will later in the course uh, have a more detailed discussion on, on the issues of safeguards and also talk about uh, the role of um, some of the, the states in the region uh, on uh, additional protocol and uh, the relationship between um, Argentina and Brazil and in accordance with ABAC. But uh, your talk gave a very, very good sort of front book end uh, for this course. So uh, we very much appreciate uh, your time and, and willingness to spend some time with uh, these, these uh, young diplomats. So um, thank you very much. And uh, I'd like to then end this session uh, on the IEA. Uh, Thank you so much, and uh, hope at your service, at your service, and and good luck, and to the students, you are getting a first-rate education from Monterey. This is one of the prime uh, places to study non-proliferation, really. And I must say, I had a number of colleagues uh, who have been educated there, uh, who went through different kinds of courses, from the master degree to short-term courses. And, and it was always, it's been a pleasure of, of uh, working with them. So uh, I envy you a little bit. I would like to go to the classroom sometimes on the other side and learn more, uh, but it's, it's also enriching uh, to, to, to be involved. So uh, good luck with the rest of your course and, and we'll be in touch. Thank Hope you. to see you in you are always most welcome to visit us in Monterey and to come and uh, teach here. So uh, please, please make a point. I'll thank you. I'll thank you all your words for this. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you very much, Atsik. Thanks okay. a lot. Um, Bye. All right.